many of you have taken a look at your bookshelf recently and identified books that are dated or books that you're missing? One of the major contributing factors to colleagues not achieving success on the CNA exam is having the wrong resources on their bookshelf. Just this week, we heard from colleagues who had five or even six books that are not going to help them achieve success on the CNA exam. The Bible, as we like to call it, that you wanna make sure that you have is going to be Billings and Halstead Teaching and Nursing, the sixth edition. Now, if you have the seventh edition, there is a, cro a crosswalk available right here in the description so you know exactly what pages to focus on. The other optional resource is Dr. Caputi's c and &E Review Book, second edition. Welcome back everybody to Dr. Sellers Educate, where our mission is to support all nurse educator colleagues to achieve excellence in the classroom, clinical area and skills in sim lab as well, and also to help you achieve success on the CNE, CNE clinical and CNE novice exam. So if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. We're happy that you found us. And send us an email and let us know where you are on your journey, info at drsellerseducate.com. We do track our success rate right now. We're between 95 and 100%, depending on the week. We have several colleagues that have been successful over the summer, and we're supporting those that weren't successful as well. Also, as you are thinking about your journey, we want you to pull out your study worksheet. So if you haven't done that already, we want you to pull that out because we want you to write down the content that we're going to discuss today. We're continuing our series, focusing on what to study and what not to study. So study this and not that is the topic of our series. We want you to not only have competency when it comes to these NLN nurse educator competencies, but we also want you to have confidence in the classroom. Well, it starts with our ability to really hone in on the content, to stay focused on our gap areas, use Billings and Halstead as our primary reference to help us close those knowledge gaps, and then we've got to invest the time to make sure we have closed those knowledge gaps. For those of you that have the study workbook, um, I hopefully you saw the message, those that are on our email list, that there's a new revised version and we're excited about this version. We've added some of the content that you all have recommended. We've also streamlined it quite a bit and it, we've added checklist as well to keep you focused. Everybody loves a great checklist, right? I know I do. All right, so let's go ahead and get into our content. We like to start with that thought-provoking question, and then we'll transition into our content. And we always wrap up, so stay with us at the end of our time together, clarifying any muddy points that you have about the thought-provoking question. In this session, we're going to talk about what is it that you should focus on when we think about clinical judgment and evaluation tools, and what is it that you don't want to waste your time reviewing to ensure that you are studying the right content and not getting distracted. We know there's so much information that we're reading about in the literature about clinical judgment and the role that it has in helping our nurses make safe patient care decisions. So let's take a look at our thought-provoking question. Which action by the clinical nurse educator best facilitate the, lead, the learner's ability to apply theory to practice? We have A, providing detailed lectures on theoretical concepts, B, using high fidelity simulations to create realistic patient scenarios, or C, assigning extensive reading from textbooks and research articles. This is what we want you to think about every single time you get to a question on the c &E exam. First of all, what is this question really asking you about? Second, what is it that I know for sure about content related to this question? Oftentimes we hear feedback from colleagues that tell us, I didn't have any questions about theory on my exam. Well, the questions may not specify the theorist that it's asking about, but you will certainly have questions related to learning theory. So make sure you take a look in chapter 14. That's for the sixth edition and for the seventh edition. And specifically in the sixth edition, table 14.1 is an excellent resource to help you clarify muddy points, solidify your comprehension, and most importantly, really equip you with information that is going to help you apply and analyze information about questions on the exam that you can expect to see related to learning theory. We know that 70 to 80 percent of those questions on the exam are going to be at that application and analysis level. So we want you to be equipped with the right content 
that you're studying in order to be in order to reach that passing score on the exam. So here's our first question. Yes or no? Do you think you have to understand Tanner's clinical judgment model? What do you think? So go ahead and write that down on your study worksheet, whether or not you think Tanner's clinical judgment model is a focus area for you as you move forward on your journey. And let's talk a little bit about your journey while you're thinking about this specific concept. We know that the CNE exam is a high stakes exam, right? Not only because it's, it's a price associated with it, but also we know that you've invested hopefully at least 100 hours reviewing content and applying those concepts. You want to use that seven-week study plan that we've outlined to help you move forward on your journey with ease. Think about it as a navigation tool. When we get in a car and we have a destination that we want to get to, we're not sure exactly what turns we should make. We're not even sure sometimes how long it's going to take for us to get there, right, if it's a new place. So you want to make sure that you have the roadmap that is going to help you on your journey, avoid wasting time. That's what this journey is all about. We want to move forward with you in a matter of ease and focusing on the right content with the right resources. All right, so hopefully you've had a time to think about that. And you are correct if you said yes, you need to have a full understanding of Tanner's clinical judgment model. Not only because we know the research tells us this is what helps us provide the safest patient care, but also because it's important for us to understand the why behind the teaching that we're doing in the classroom. Now, this is directly from Tanner's article, Thinking Like a Nurse, a research-based model of clinical judgment in nursing. It is published in the Journal of Nursing Education. What I want to bring to your attention first and foremost is you may not see on the CNE exam Tanner's clinical judgment model specifically or the NCSBN model, but this is what we know when it comes to our teaching strategies that we're selecting, we want to help students move through this process, move through this journey in making the safest patient care decisions. So we know the first phase is associated with noticing. Now, Students get enter into this phase a number of different ways, but first and foremost, it's in the classroom, right, where we're teaching content. We align it with context, and let me explain a little bit about what I mean. When we teach students about blood pressures and what the systolic and diastolic mean, we want to add context to that conversation. That means that when it's appropriate in our nursing program, we want to explain to students not only what happens in the body with the systolic and diastolic process to the heart and how blood circulates through the body, we also want to align it with decisions that they're making about medication administration, about whether or not this is normal or abnormal, and what is it that they are able to analyze as a result of that data that they have? Okay, so that's interpreting, right? They're re they have reasoning patterns. They're analyzing what that data means. They're using their intuition. That's that gut. They're thinking about their prior experiences, pulling in some of Cobb's experiential learning theory when we think about reflective observation. And then they're making a decision, right? We are responding with an action based on that data, based on our interpretation and analyzation of that content or that patient care data that we have been informed about. And then we're thinking about the outcomes. And then we're reflecting, right? This reflection happens continuously, but in Tanner's clinical judgment model, and just like with Cobb's experiential learning theory, there's a time in the process where we're reflecting on what went well, what didn't go so well, and then what am I going to do differently next time? That's that context. That's that relationship and background as well that students cycle through when we look at Tanner's clinical judgment model. So absolutely what you want to understand with Tanner's clinical judgment model is that there's a process that we should take students through. There's a journey. There are phases associated with the learning process that Tanner talks about. It's important for us to have alignment with our teaching strategies. We don't want to just create innovative, fun, exciting teaching strategies because we want the students to pay attention. Now, that is important, right? We do not want our students falling asleep in class. And we want to align it with what the evidence says about, with, about the teaching strategies and how they impact 
the learning process, whether it's Cobes experiential learning theory or Tanner's clinical judgment model. We want to understand the why. Why are we incorporating certain didactic content? Have we aligned it and mapped it back to our learning objectives and our student learning outcomes? Have we aligned it and mapped it with our exam, right? Do we have an exam blueprint? And then we want to think about the level, of course, when we think about the cognitive learning domain, as well as our psychomotor learning domain and our effective learning domain, we want to think about how is it aligning, how are our teaching strategies aligning with flowing students through the clinical judgment process? And then how does theory align with practice? It's not enough just to know the what. We have to help students understand the how. How is this data going to influence my decisions as we are taking students through this Tanner's clinical judgment model? All right, and then we have some additional resources to help guide you as you're thinking about what next steps are going to be. Um, so the snapshots are going to be 14 and 17. 14 is an introduction. 17 goes a little deeper, not only into clinical judgment, but also critical reasoning and clinical um, judgment, critical thinking. How do we help students go through the process of learning so that they can solidify and really make those safe patient care decisions, right? There's a comprehension element that we have to make sure we're validating with our students as it relates to patient care. All right, our next concept that we're going to talk about is clinical checklist and decision-making tools. So do you think this is an area you need to focus on as you're moving forward on your journey? Or do you think this is more advanced knowledge? All right, so think about that, yes or no. Do you think this is an area that you need to consider? And let me explain a little bit more. So when we talk about clinical checklists, this is often our um, final skills checkoff in our um, fundamentals class or health assessment, depending on where you have it in your curriculum. Or it could be the final skills checklist in the clinical area. So do you feel like you have to have an understanding of the content for each step of the channel, clinical checklist. And then those decision-making tools, do you think this is an area you have to focus on or not as much? All right, so if you chose no, you are correct. All right, so let me explain a little bit about it. So when it comes to decision-making tools or algorithms, that's not going to be an area that's going to be focused on on your exam. But what we'll be focused on, whether it's the CNE, CNE clinical, or the CNE novice, is the why behind our clinical tools that we're developing. We want to use evidence-based strategies to develop our tools. We want to have a rubric, right? Because we want to inform students about what is required to meet expectations and how they can reach that exceptional level, if that's an option for the tool that you're developing. And then what do we evaluate? That is going to be an area that you will be expected to validate on the exam. The why we use our clinical tools, the what, what is the content that we're including on our checklist, but the actual names of tools, you shouldn't expect to see that, but you want to go deeper in understanding why we're using these tools. What is it that we're evaluating? How are we validating competency when we are looking at behaviors that our students are demonstrating? Okay, so that's what you want to focus on when you think about those checklists. It's not necessarily the content on that checklist for health assessment or fundamentals, whether or not you're including a skin assessment or the respiratory system, right? It's not a clinical um, nurse educator certification, even for the CNE clinical, it's really not about the content that we teach in the classroom. It really is how and what we are teaching and how it aligns with our ability to validate knowledge and competency. What do we do with the information? That's another really important area. Okay, so stay with me when it comes to the CNE exam. Based on the data that we have gathered, we talk about data a lot because it helps inform our decisions. It helps us validate whether or not learning has happened. It helps also students build their confidence. That's why we want to give formative feedback as students are moving through the nursing courses. We want to give the formative feedback, whether that's checking in with the student and observing them in the clinical setting and saying, you know what, you did a really good job inserting that Foley today. I noticed this time you were able to take deep breaths and you were able to process the steps and share them with the patient what you were doing. And last time I didn't see you verbalize and communicate to the patient um, as much as you did this time. How did 
did that make you feel? Do you feel like that helped you be more effective and competent in your skills? So just thinking about how we can support that student on the clinical side and giving them that formative feedback as well as on the didactic side. That can be through adaptive quizzing because I know many of us are using what I like to call it third-party software and really our partner on this journey to help students achieve excellence as a nursing student. And then remediation, given time or allotting time for students to come to the skills lab, right? And to embrace those gap areas. We wanna partner with them to bridge that theory practice gap. We wanna decrease that anxiety and decrease that wall when it comes to the relationship that is so important with our students to help equip them with the skills the knowledge and the ability and the attitudes that they need to not only build competency, but also to be confident in the patient care decisions that they are making. Our goal is to identify what other interventions do I need to make with my student to help them close the loop and so that patients can have better outcomes, but also so that our students can achieve success. All right, so let's get back and wrap up our time with our thought-provoking question. So if you chose B, give yourself a round of applause. You are correct. So using high-fidelity simulations to create realistic patient scenarios is going to be the best way to help facilitate learners' ability to apply theory to practice, help bridge in that gap. If we give detailed lectures, there's no evidence to say that when we teach, students learn, right? So we have to think about how can we create more realistic scenarios to help students really see themselves in that clinical space. And we know extensive reading also does not translate over into learning. So what I want you to think about is do a real self-assessment of yourself right now. So what is your number? Do you feel like you're lost at one or five, you're ready to teach? The strongest way to retain information at that 90% threshold is when we're able to apply concepts and be able to teach them. Okay, so that's what you wanna think about. You can see this testimonial that we're delighted to hear from you all when you're on your journey. Let us know if you felt equipped based on the resources that we're providing, or if there was a gap, we wanna hear from you all too. So just let us know how you're doing on your journey. We hope that this snapshot has been helpful and we look forward to seeing you in the next one. Any questions that you have, you can head over to our website, drsellerseducate.com, or you can email us info at drsellerseducateaswell.com. We know that this is a really important decision as you move forward on your journey. We are here to support you on your journey to achieve CNE success, no matter how long it takes. We look forward to supporting you as you take your next step.